Welcome to The Authority File, the podcast where you'll hear conversations with academic librarians, technologists, researchers, and authors whose work is laying the foundation for higher education's future. I'm Bill Mickey, your host and the editorial director at Choice. In this four-part series, which is brought to you with support from Wilfrid Laurier University Press, my guests and I have an extremely fun conversation about research. Now, you might ask, what's so fun about talking about research? That's a good question, so tune into the next four episodes and find out. But I'll give you some hints, starting with our guests. Joining me are Beth Driscoll, Associate Professor of Publishing and Communications at the University of Melbourne, and Claire Squires, Professor of Publishing Studies at the University of Stirling. Claire and Beth are co-authors of a self-published novella called The Frankfurt Kaboof, a comic erotic thriller about the book publishing industry with the Frankfurt Book Fair serving as the setting. Now, out from Wilfrid Laurier University Press as a critical edition, it includes an introduction, annotated text, and 15 contributed essays. The book is actually a research project, the culmination of years of fieldwork that employs a host of artistic and creative approaches aimed at upending traditional scholarly workflows that result, in this case, as an examination of the power dynamics and creative economies of book publishing. But our conversation goes way beyond the book industry, focusing on the intersection of scholarly publishing, creativity, and yes, fun, to explore how a more disruptive approach can result in serious scholarship. In this third episode of our four-part series, our guests and I discuss their manifesto, which helps guide their arts-informed research. It's called the Ulapulism Manifesto, and it's named after a certain book fair in Ulapool, a village in Northern Scotland. Okay, so I'm sure um, everyone from the last episode was curious about this manifesto that you've both put together. Um, so let's talk about that. Uh, can you describe it for us and maybe boil it down to just a few, um, you know, salient concepts? You know, for example, one seems to be a call for disrupting the slow pace and traditional traditionalism of research. Um, another one is addressing structures of privilege and power. So, you know, um, before we get into like the breakdown of the points of the manifesto, like what are some of the key ideas that it's it's kind of addressing <laughs> yeah um interestingly there's, there's probably too much discussion of origin stories here but we did come up with this manifesto or at least the points of the when we were at frankfurt kind of sprawling on some oversized bean bags from what i can remember <laughs> so they did exist as a handwritten notes of the, the points um there's 11 manifesto points and i think kind of just looking at them um, we won't have time, obviously, to go through each individual one. Um, but actually, just thinking about number one and number 11, I think mm. that kind of encapsulates it. There's a whole load in the middle. But number one is, is playfulism. And that kind of fun is so important to us. But number 11 is scholarly direct action. So there's an agenda here. There's a real agenda, yep. political agenda. And I think the bits in between are also important. But I think just that transition from one to 11 kind of really indicates, um, yeah, the overall yeah. intent. <laughs> right. And I'm just remembering the first article we wrote was called Serious Fun. So that, that really is that encapsulation of both the fun but the serious intent. Exactly. Yeah, and we, we developed that manifesto really just as a kind of a set of guiding points for ourselves that would help us decide, you know, what projects we'd like to take on together into the future and then just how we wanted to keep working and what we valued and wanted to keep in the mix for our work together. And it's been really helpful for that. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So I had um, kind of landed on principle number 11 as well and scholarly direct action. Um, and, you know, I, I look at it sort of as the scholarship is activism, I guess, I, you know, how is this, as you say, at the heart of, you know, the project of volatilism? Yeah. I mean, I think academic, work has the power to be quite influential in terms of how people understand the world mm -hmm. and that that's all scholarly work so in a way this is just naming what all scholarship does it it has got political heft and being explicit about that and acknowledging it and then being thoughtful about the kind of work we want to do with our scholarship um, and you know sometimes that might be taking to the streets and waving placards we haven't done that yet but I'm not ruling it out 
Um, but at other times, it might be these more subtle, playful interventions that have that political purpose that we want to um, unsettle people or to create alternative visions for how the future might be. And um, yeah, I think it's just a it's really about recognising that it's not like there's the university and then there's the real world. What we do in the university is part of the real world and our scholarship matters in that way. Yeah, and I think there's this kind of particular and important issues around power and hierarchies of power of of both of the worlds that we're particularly engaged with, so that world's within the academy and also within the publishing industry and I suppose the creative industries more broadly and, you know, kind of writ, writ large a, a, across the globe, certainly in the, the Anglophone countries, you know, within which we're working, those, both of those sectors are, you know, they're, they're kind of dominated by white men. <laughs> There's mm. no doubt about it. There are right. all sorts of issues with structures of power. Um, and, and that, that, that's really important to us to, to, to kind of think through both the sector within, you know, in which we are employed, I suppose, mm-hmm. but also the sector within which we work really closely and often in a very kind of embedded way as well and thinking about, um, you know, how we, how we might work, um, with peers to, to enact change in various different ways. That's, that's really important to us. And there's, you know, there's some really big issues that actually need change in, in both of those sectors. Yeah. Right. So the, the, the third principle um, is art, wherein you describe your work as art to, and I'm going to quote, uh, distinguish it forcibly from the traditional outputs of an instrumentalized university system and from the marketplace of commercial transactions. Um, and I know we, we've, we've touched on this concept in a, a, in a different in different ways throughout our conversation so far, but it, it's just, this is really fascinating for me. And, and so how can art you know, act as a as a research output essentially. It's very grand when uh, you read that back to us in that way. <laughs> yeah, I was going to say, in some ways, it's a bit a bit of a joke because some of what we produce is very rapid. You know, amateurism, rapidism is another of our principles. And so, mm. if we dash off a comic strip in five minutes um, and then hold it up and announce this is art and have it published in a book, like that, that's quite amusing to us. In in that satirical sense, because of course the art world has its own hierarchies and structures and right. um, you know power dynamics that you know it's not like some isolated realm from everything that we're critiquing. But I think calling something art is a way of standing up for its value, and we do see the work we're doing as being very valuable, uh, even when it looks trivial or silly, or especially when it looks trivial and silly. I would say. Mm. Mm. And, you know, there's a great history of uh, really interesting conceptual artists often working collaboratively and, you know, coming up with really interesting things to say that I think we're very inspired by. That's true. There is some overlap there in in, in certain areas where, you know, if you're pointing out, uh, you know, especially in, in, in sort of the political and social realms, you know, where art does a really good job of expressing that and obviously research does too. So. Um, we love the Gorilla Girls as an example of an art activist group that we find very inspiring. Oh, excellent. Okay. So I should mention that we'll, we'll definitely link to the manifesto itself on the on the episode page for this episode. Um, but I, I'm also curious about principle number five, which is the predicament. Um, and to me, I don't know, it seems a little risky in its enablement uh, of, as you say, you know, improper research and resisting the requirements of, of prior ethics approval. Um, you know, I, I, I suppose I might be a little dramatic here, but this kind of approach is sort of a chaotic or anarchic concept um, it, within research. And I, I wonder if this is potentially more concerning than it is hopeful. <laughs> I, I think it's I think it's entirely right to push us on this question and actually some of the work I think we're going to do in, in the future we've we've written a little bit about this and we have some examples um in terms of the work that we've done on sexual harassment um mm. that I think is a good example of how you might deal with this but I think it's I think it's 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 a really important one to think through particularly when you are an autoethnographic researcher, and you're one that's working in a very embodied way um, within scenarios. It's not like we're remote researchers 
who come to our field to study it and we don't have any involvement with us with it and I, I think for me um I'm sure Beth will add on to this as well I think to tie that number five in with number 11 so the scholarly mm-hmm. direct action is absolutely crucial so um yes of course we want to act as ethical researchers we go through the ethics process but there's probably also it's really important for researchers to think is that inhibiting speaking Mm. truth to power in any way right Um, i I think that's really really important to to think through Mm. yeah i think that's it it's part of recognizing that we work in institutions and often those institutions have processes like ethics processes that are there for very good reasons and to do really good work Um, But we also need to be critical of our own institutions and think about, well, in some cases, are those processes not serving the purpose that they they should be? And, you know, it doesn't mean ignoring them. It just means engaging critically with your own institution's ethics processes and being part of those conversations about what does it mean to be an actually ethical researcher in the world doing the kind of work that we're doing. And, you know, it's just good to cultivate a little bit of a rebellious spirit. It doesn't You know, it doesn't have to be anarchy, but it does mean not always (laughs) towing the line without talking back. Yeah. Excellent. Okay. Thank you. You just heard from Beth Driscoll, Associate Professor of Publishing and Communications at the University of Melbourne, and Claire Squires, Professor of Publishing Studies at the University of Stirling. Beth and Claire are co-authors of a novella called The Frankfurt Kabuff. This series is brought to you with support from Wilfrid Laurier University Press. Join us next week when our guests discuss how their creative approaches to research can be applied across disciplines and why we should never forget to create room for debate and thought as we hone the craft of scholarly communications. As always, underwriting opportunities for the Authority File podcast are directed by Choices Advertising Manager Pam Marino, and all of our episodes are produced and edited by Choices Digital Media Producer Sabrina Kofer, with support from Digital Media Assistant Ashley Roy. That's all for this week. Thanks for joining us.